and welcome to Around the World in 80 Ts, the first few stops. My name is Sharon Hall and I'm the Chief Executive of the UK Tea and Infusions Association and today we are going to talk about English breakfast tea with my co-host Will Battle and our guests Andrew Jefford and Katie Kipax. Katie has spent the last two years tasting and developing her palate whilst learning how to choose the best teas to blend together in her role as tea buyer at Taylors of Harrogate, the home of Yorkshire tea. Andrew Jefford has written about wine and other beverages for 33 years, notably for Decanter, The World of Fine Wines and The Financial Times. He has written 13 books and guides, including Andrew Jefford's Wine Course and Whiskey Island. Will Battle, my co-host of Fine Tea Merchants, has 25 years experience in the tea industry and has worked in tea businesses around the world. He's also the author of the World Tea Encyclopedia. Will, Andrew and Katie, welcome to the podcast. Good to be with you. Thank you. Globally, tea is the most consumed beverage after water, with well over 100 million cups of tea drunk every single day of the year in the UK. The majority of the tea that we drink here in the UK is a blend of black teas, often referred to as English breakfast tea. I'll hand over to Will so we can find out more. Thanks, Sharon. Katie, I'm going to start with you if I can. Do you think you can explain broadly what it is that you do as a tea expert on a day to day basis? Yes, of course. So on a day to day basis, I'll mainly be communicating directly with our suppliers, analysing tea market data, managing stocks and logistics, which is getting the tea basically from origin to our factory here in Harrogate. We also have to do a lot of risk management, as you probably are all aware, you know, with a, with a commodity like tea, it's a natural product, things like weather, shipping, all sorts of different things can affect it. So that is a massive part of our role. And also the sensory analysis of tea, so tea tasting, is also a really, really massive part. So normally we'll receive samples from our suppliers at the office. And our special tea tasting room will brew these teas in a very specific way. So they usually weigh them up to a specific weight, usually double strength, so it can be quite strong. And at Taylor's, we use hard water specifically. So this is because it brings out the tannins in the tea, the calcium in the hard water reacts with it and it increases the flavor. So we use that in order to get the best taste possible. They also brew it for five and a half minutes, which you probably think is quite a long time. But again, that allows the tea to release all of the flavor, which we need to taste. They will add a specific amount of milk, give it a good stir, and then it's ready for us tea buyers to taste. So when we go down the counter, we'll first observe the leaves. So many, many buyers around the world buy leaves on their appearance, but for us, it's the liquor that's more important. So even though the leaves may not be the reason we buy a tea, it's still very important for us to determine how a tea's been manufactured and how well it's been manufactured. So we'll look at things like bloom, which is the shine on the tea. We'll look for things like fiber. So that'll be this orange consistency, which comes from the veins of the leaf of the plant. And we'll even look at the consistency of the sample, whether the grades, so the grades of tea are basically you've got larger grades, smaller grades, we'll see that, that that consistency is there. After that, we'll inspect the infusion. So at Yorkshire Tea, we like a lovely bright coppery infusion. Um, some other buyers may look for a redder, a redder color or other colors, but we, we like a nice golden infusion. And the final, the final stage is the taste. So what we do is we slurp the tea, nice big slurp, and um, that, that's in order to spray all of your taste buds in your mouth with the tea. I think you've probably got over, I think it's 9,000 taste buds, which, you know, if you spray it around there, it increases the surface area. And that, that's really important because we need to be able to bring out the taints in the tea. So whether it's burnt, whether there's any smoke, but also look for the positive attributes as well, such as flavor. So we'll look for things like, does, is it for an Assam, for example, does it have a multi taste? How strong is the flavor and how, how strong does it stay in your mouth? We also assess things like body. So for people that 
maybe this this is quite a difficult concept to explain but it's basically how heavy the tea feels on your mouth and whether it produces a nice mouth feel and you've also got briskness which we look for as well so that is how astringent the tea is you know does it stay around in your mouth for a long time so after we've done our tea tasting and analysed markets and everything else that we do, that, that takes up quite a full day. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thanks, Katie. And, it, and I, ultimately, those teas that you spent your day tasting and, and selecting will arrive in the UK and uh, some will have to blend them together into uh, an English breakfast blend, effectively. Um, can you just describe in, in broad terms what an English breakfast blend is to you um, and perhaps even what a few typical origins might be and why? Of course, so I think interestingly I'll take you through how breakfast tea became breakfast tea. So it's thought to have been created by a Scottish tea master called Strasdale who in 1892 required a strong flavoured tea to cut through the average breakfast so as you know, fry ups, bacon, sausage, all of that, you need a nice brew to, to cut through that. And that was called breakfast tea. And I think it was actually Queen Victoria herself, where uh, during her stay at Balmoral, actually tasted this tea and brought it back to London and then controversially named it breakfast tea. <laughs> so that's a little bit of brief history. But breakfast tea is generally a full bodied, robust, rich cup, which you taste it and you think, ah, oh, that's that's lovely. And the reason why breakfast tea is that is due to the components. So one of the main components will be a Sam tea, which obviously is from Assam in India. And I think the reason for that is because it, it's so gutty and it gives you such a punch. Um, but also what I was talking about in terms of body as well is that's why the tea tastes and feels thick in your mouth. That's due to the Assam tea. Um, some people will also put Ceylon tea, so that's from Sri Lanka, and that will give a really nice mellow flavour, which will cut through to give a nice briskness. And also Kenyan teas as well are usually included in breakfast tea, which are usually there for their brightness. Um, and all of those components together in the blend, they stand up to the traditionally meaty elements of a breakfast. So it's a really good an accompaniment, as well as the condiments as well. So you think brown sauce, tomato ketchup, strong flavours you need a good tea to to battle that so I hope that answers your question on breakfast tea. It does very well thanks Katie although it gives Sharon and I a problem because this is called um, English breakfast this podcast and now it seems that we, we need we need to rename it Scottish breakfast um, <laughs> if, if it originated in Scotland. Um, Andrew you're resident in France what's yeah. your experience of the English breakfast styles of tea that you might get on the continent? They're pretty miserable actually in general. <laughs> but what you have to remember is that um, nobody here is going to be drinking it with milk. That's the first thing. So that immediately means that the sort of robustness that Katie was on about has to be put into context. It needs to be tempered a little bit. Uh, and then the second thing to remember is that the majority of people on continental Europe don't actually grow up with a tea culture like people in the UK do. In the UK, you know, if you have a builder or a plumber around, you, you offer him a cup of tea or a mug of tea, of course, it's, that's what you do. Uh, when we have a, a plumber or a builder come around to our house in France, it's always, would you like a coffee? And if he says yes, it's a little espresso. So the whole culture of, of, uh, a bit of hot beverage is completely different here. And again, I think it needs to be seen in that context too. The default is always coffee and tea is number two behind, behind coffee. That's not to say that people in continental Europe aren't really interested in tea, they are, and they're often much more adventurous when it comes to buying tea and trying tea than, than people are in the UK. But nonetheless, they're gonna be drinking it without milk and it is number two within the beverage, the hot beverage culture. It's, it's interesting that point actually, that um, the experiment, the willingness to experiment perhaps not having come from a tea drinking culture. I wonder if your preparedness to try a tea without milk opens up more possibilities for you as, a, as an experimenter. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, if, 
if I if I could wish one thing on the British tea drinker, it would be that he or she uh, is prepared at least once in a while to to give tea without milk a try. Because, for example, you know China is a wonderful resource of fascinating teas. What is it they say they have? I think it's two thousand teas, something like that. Colossal amount, uh, enormously rich culture. But really, none of them make sense if you put milk in them. In fact, if you really want to discover the richness of the of the world of tea, you have to have a go at tea without milk at some point or another. I always find it interesting how those different drinking cultures kind of evolved. And we, um, and I, I think, as with many things in trade, it's often the Dutch who are responsible. And uh, we spent uh, three or four years living in the Netherlands and. Uh, if, one thing I can tell you about a Dutch lunch in the office is that it's normally served with two different types of milk and no water. So the Dutch do love milk, but they don't like it in their tea. And, and I think that heritage of perhaps getting their teas from China and Indonesia and trading them into continental Europe, when perhaps the British consumer might have got their tea from Salon and Assam has, has probably just lent us these, these different drinking styles. And it's great that they endure to this day when you can still, you can buy your tea from anywhere now, but the, the drinking habits endure. Yeah, absolutely. And there's room in your life for both, isn't there? I mean, certainly doing this job in the Tea Association, I haven't dropped my daily habit of drinking four to six English breakfast cups of tea every day, but I've made room to try other types of teas as well. I've added those in. And I think, you know, everybody should give that a go. Yeah. So English breakfast is uh, ordinarily a, a blend of different origins. And, and as Katie explained it, it um, would often include salons and Assams and Kenyans. And blending as a word can, can sometimes be regarded negatively, which is, I don't think, always entirely fair. Andrew, can you bring some perspective on, on how blending um, is used as a tool in the wine and spirits trade. Yeah, with great pleasure. Um, blending is colossally, colossally important uh, in, in wine and spirits production. Um, what's it achieving? I mean, I'm a huge admirer of blenders, so I'm shattered and horrified to hear it might have any sort of pejorative term. For me, it's, it's, it's only positive. Uh, what it's really trying to do is, number one, to make the whole better than the sum of its parts. That's the first thing. And of course, that immediately puts the emphasis on, on human creativity and craftsmanship. That's, that's the wonderful thing about blending. It's all of your raw materials <clears throat> have been given to you by nature to a greater or lesser extent. But the craftsmanship comes in, first of all, with the processing of the raw materials, and we're not talking about that at this point, and then with that blending stage. So, so that's incredibly important. And the second thing really is that blending is the way that you bring harmony to any beverage. Harmony and completeness really are always the aims that you're looking for when you're blending. Uh, and if anybody uh, takes time to enjoy a drink and thinks, wow, that was fantastic, I'm sure that harmony and completeness somewhere or other will be in their kind of tick list of things that they found in that drink. There are very few great drinks where that doesn't apply. Now, if we run quickly through, through the drink world, um, blending is of varying degrees of importance depending on the drink. For example, um, vodka, blending not very important. Uh, you know, vodka is all about uh, raw ingredients and then distillation. You should do those two things as well as you can, and then you will have a vodka of some interest. Uh, gin, gin is about botanicals, in other words, the, the flavorings you're going to use, and it's about distillation as well. And again, there's an enormous amount of complexity and craft you can put into both of those aspects, but it's not really about blending. However, when you come to a drink like whiskey, for example, then blending is suddenly enormously important. Uh, all, well, about 90% of the whiskey we drink is something called blended whiskey. That automatically gives you a clue as to how significant <laughs> the act of blending is in the whiskey world. And what blended whiskey is, is a, is a combination of two different types of basic whiskey, there's grain whiskey, produced from a certain set of grains in a certain way. And then there's malt whiskey, which is produced from just one grain alone, malted barley, using two sequential pot stills. So two different things altogether. 
And it, it, the bringing together of those two elements uh, is immensely complex because they all come from different distilleries and every distillery will give you a different character. So you have a vast repertoire of raw materials and all of the great uh, you know, whiskies um, that, that we're familiar with and the top sort of luxurious whiskies that we fantasize about, most of those are in fact combinations of uh, grain and malt whiskey, which have been put together by blenders using uh, enormous skill and, uh, and using and calling it also on, on precedent to some extent as well. They're, they're great traditions. Every blending house has its own traditions and so on. Uh, even by the way, malt whiskey, which comes from a single distillery, it, blending even plays a role there because you should know that all, the, all whiskey is aged in second-hand casks. Now that means they're all different. Uh, some are good, some are less good. And uh, with malt whiskey, in, in general, in my opinion, the distillery version of the malt whiskey is better than an, often than an independent bottler's single cask version. Because again, the blender has worked on the distillery version. It would be a selection of casks that have been blended to provide the apogee, the essence of the character of that distillery to some extent. So whiskey it, blending is enormously important. Go on to cognac as well. Uh, it's every bit as important in cognac as it is with whiskey. Um, if you have a chance ever to try a cognac from a single farm and a single vintage, yeah, that's interesting because it comes from a particular place. Cognac is zoned into different zones and it comes from a particular vintage and everybody likes a single vintage. But I guarantee those will not be the best cognacs you've ever tried. They'll be singular, they'll be characterful, but they won't have that wonderful symphonic nuance and subtlety that you'll get with a great blended cognac. Let's now go on to the wine world. Now on the surface of it, it seems as if in the wine world, probably it's a little bit less important and you could make a case that blending is a bit less important because many of the great, the greatest wines of all come from single vineyards and single vintages, just as I've described with the cognacs and said how inadequate it was with cognac. Well, it's not inadequate with wine, it can be fantastic. But then if you think about, you know, the kind of wine that most of us are drinking on an everyday basis, branded wine, then blending is enormously important there. You know, Blossom Hill, uh, Jacob's Creek, uh, you know, all of these famous wines, the Gallo wines, you know, they're, they're huge, huge blends. And of course, they're not meant to be the greatest wines in the world. Uh, but believe you me, an enormous amount of work goes into the sourcing of wines for those and the way you put them together. And definitely the blending is a crucial part of that. We also, you know, have sort of more upmarket branded wines. Now I'm thinking of something like Whispering Angel, for example, a very successful rosé from Provence. Uh, that was originally quite a small production wine, but it became so popular that now 6% of the whole of the Côte de Provence appellation, which is an enormous appellation, goes into Whispering Angel. So that's another colossal blend. And all of the basic wines will be slightly different. So putting those together into a harmonious hull, which reflects the tradition of that wine is, is, is um, quite skillful. Finally, I should also say that very often when you see what appears to be a single vineyard wine in a single vintage, nonetheless, there will have been an element of blending in that too. I'll give you a couple of examples particularly applies where properties are quite big. So if you go to Bordeaux, where properties do tend to be quite big, you go to, well, let's go straight to the top. Let's go to Chateau Lafitte or Chateau Margaux. Now these are quite big uh, vineyards. Uh, Chateau Lafitte is more or less, it's over a hundred hectares actually. And uh, Margaux is about 70 hectares. Now, not every single hectare of that vineyard will be as good as every other. No, uh, in Burgundy terms, you'll have some sort of village level some premier crew level and some grand crew level. And of course, the great way to maximize the, the quality and develop the reputation of your wine there is not to chuck it all in bottle and call it all Chateau Lafitte or Chateau Margaux. You have to select and very often, in fact, only about 25 to 40% of the entire production of those vineyards in any one year will go into the, the finished product. You'll, they, they will make them all separately in small lots. Then there will be a long blending process and at the end of all of that, they'll arrive at their, the Grand Vins, it's called the great wine of the year, but it will only have between 25 and, and 45% of, the, of the, the entire vineyard there too. And very final thing to say is there's another category of wine called fortified wine, 
This is wine which has alcohol added, like port or sherry. And blending has also been enormously important in those categories too. If we take sherry, the very way you make sherry is by a sort of institutional blending, which happens automatically. It's a, a system called the Solera system, a fractional blending system. Uh, those Soleras were begun often 80, 100 years ago. A little bit of wine is added to the top layer, and then it goes through different layers, keep being mixed all the time, and then it comes out at the bottom layer, and you bottle what comes out at the bottom. And by then, it's been fractionally blended to an extraordinary degree of mathematical complexity. And that's how you get both the wonderful quality that you can get with a great cherry, but also absolute consistency and the elimination of any vintage character. That's interesting. It's the opposite of what you want for wine. And then finally, well, let's finish with, as great meals often do finish, with a glass of vintage port. Now, vintage port is well under, well under 1% of all of the production of the entire region in any one vintage. It's absolutely the creme de la creme de la creme. Enormous efforts go into sort of finding the very best parcels in any particular year and putting those together. And that's, that's a, a pretty challenging blending job too. And it's also a very serious matter because you, know, you might blend, uh, let's say the vintage port for 2021. Uh, it won't really be judged, your success with it won't really be known until about 2051. So you're, you're really creating the future reputation of your house in the blending work you do. So it's, it's an act of extra, extraordinary consequentiality as well. So there you are, blending, definitely important in the wine and spirits world. Thanks so much, Andrew, that's fascinating. I mean, I guess the, the romantic view is of the whiskey or, or port blender or, or in any of those scenarios you described being a, a sort of grizzled old pro and, and he or she has everything up here and it's all you just know what you're going to mix together but I guess it's a whole lot more complex and what is the what is the approach that one takes is it, is it sort of can it be computerized or can it be um, fingerprinted more precisely than just you know that this blend this wine is going to blend well with that one well, really, the answer is all of the above. Um, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of precedent which counts in all of this. For example, at Chateau Latour, they know there are always certain parcels that will always go into the top wine, regardless. And then there's another set of parcels that might or might not. And then there's another set of parcels that never really will. Uh, so, so there is an element of that. And then to go on to your sort of grizzled question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say, let's say Katie and I were sort of working on a, a wine blend. You know, I'm the grizzled end of things. Uh, and that's quite important because experience does count for a lot too. But Katie's taste buds will be much, much more acute and her sense of smell will be much, much more acute than mine is. So I will be deferring to Katie in questions of acuity when it comes to sort of putting together four or five wines and saying, well, you know, is this there or is that there? Do you find this or do you find that? So you definitely need, you definitely need uh, the, the, the great uh, facultative acuity of the younger taster and blender, as, as well as the, 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 the grizzled gray haired end of things. <laughs> so we let, well, let's pick up on that, um, Katie. We, we've got the teas that you've bought. They've arrived in your warehouse and someone's got to assemble them into the, the house style to make sure that I guess, the consumers getting what they expect. How do you go about that? So that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, so I think the most important thing for the blender is they've really got to understand how different the teas taste. So they've got to be an expert on the country of origins, things like how sunlight, humidity, altitude, soil nutrients, all of those aspects will affect the taste of the tea. And they've got to understand that the gardens that we buy from at different times of the year, there may be quality peaks. There also may be times where the quality completely drops. So seasonality as well is something that they need to be aware of. Um, you also need to be aware of how the tea is going to travel. And that's something that we really look at when we're buying the tea in the first place. You've got to remember that these teas are on a ship for a really quite a long time. And if there's any delays, it's even longer. So there's got to be an awareness of how these teas are going to travel and how they will last when they're in the warehouse, even before they can be put into a blend. 
So a blend will come together when a blender will taste a set of teas that have landed and they will choose, hand, basically hand pick a recipe in which will be blended together in the factory. And the way that this happens is that the blender's really got to understand that this tea will go well with this tea. Or if you put too many, you know, Malawi teas in the blend, it's not, it's not going to create the desired effect. So there's a real balance effect that happens. And I think every tea that, that arrives in our factory is tasted at least five times before it even gets to that stage. And that is on its own and within a blend. And then what's called benchmarking is a process that we go through as well. So when a blend is made, you'll taste it against the last blend that was approved. And then at the end of the month, you'll taste that against even more blends that were done, you know, 10 years ago, one year ago to ensure that that consistency is always there because we know that our consumers will definitely be able to pick up anything that changes <laughs> so yeah it's really really important that 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 happens and if if a tea is not up to standard so if a blend doesn't come out the way it is it'll be reworked to the point that it's it's perfection really and it is an art it's not something that somebody can just go into you've got to train you've got to learn You've got to understand all of the aspects of tea buying in order to blend because it, it really is it really is an art. When it comes to tasting, how important are the eyes in tea? That's that's a really good question. Um, very important, but also on the side of caution, sometimes your eyes can deceive you. So as part of my training actually we do what's called blind tasting so we'll be, we'll be given a blindfold and a set of teas from different origins and you basically got to taste them blind and say where they're from and it is quite a difficult it's quite a difficult thing to do but it, it's quite rewarding actually when you can pick out the different origins but when, when you look at a set of tea and you see some are brighter some are more golden you almost think in your head that's going to be a better tea or that's going to be a worse tea and it, it definitely does play a part especially when you're inspecting things like the leaf and the infusion as well as the liquor but I think when it comes down to it it's got to be the taste as well. On taste now I guess one of the things that you have to deal with is the fact we've got a bit of regional variation in waters in the UK how do you deal with that how do you manage it? So Taylor's was actually built upon regional changes in water. So it was, it was Charles Taylor originally who created blends in Harrogate for specific regions. And, and that's something that we've really held on to today. So you'll see different blends. You'll have like a hard water blend, soft water blends. And I think for us as blenders, the reason why we taste in hard water is essentially because it brings out the flavors in the tea. So you've got to understand that if people are drinking these teas within hard water regions, they're going to be picking out basically the same stuff that, that we could potentially pick out. So again, that, that puts extra pressure on the blender to ensure that the blend is, is correct. Because as, as you know, in soft water, it can hide some of the, the taste of the tea, um, which, which you know has, it, has its benefits. But yeah, we do ensure that everything is, is tasted in hard water and that, that is something that we're quite proud of with our history. One for you, Andrew. Mm. Your background in wine. Well, what would you say um, are the parallels between the world of wine and the world of tea? For me, they're the perfect companions. Uh, I always think when you've had enough tea, it's time for wine. And when you've had enough wine, it's time for tea. And there's really almost nothing in between. It's, it's one or the other. Of course, that means mostly you're drinking tea, um, but, but eventually even I have had enough tea and it's time for a glass of wine. Uh, no, but more seriously, uh, that, that's sort of on the, the actual consumption side of it, but more seriously on the sort of cultural side of it, uh, there, there are a huge number of similarities. Um, both, for example, are made from a single plant, Camellia sinensis in the case of tea, Betis vinifera in the case of wine. Um, both... Uh, origin is extraordinarily important for both drinks. We've heard Katie talk about, you know, the origins being very important, Malawi, Kenya, Assam, you know, Ceylon, all very different. Um, so origin creates difference in both worlds. Origin creates difference in the wine world, origin creates difference in the tea world. 
Um, and then, of course, you, you have variety, the question of variety. Uh, I, I alluded a little bit earlier to the enormous, enormous variety of teas that you get in China. And a lot of that is, is actually based, well, both on, on origin and place, but also on actual strain, uh, particular strain of Camellia sinensis. Uh, exactly, in exactly the same way that the wine world for many people is predicated on grape variety. Uh, that's the easiest way to understand the wine world. Understanding it by origin is a complex intellectual challenge, which many people enjoy, but not everybody does. And if you don't enjoy it, an easier way is to come in by grape varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Shiraz, Syrah, Chardonnay, Syrah, um, Grenache, and so on and so forth, all of those. And that, that's in a way, the, the, there is a tea analogy to that too. And then, well, perhaps finally, we should, we should come to this, this um, notion which is treated with great reverence in the wine world, the notion of terroir. Uh, terroir, in its French word, it, essentially it means something like placeness. Um, when you, you taste a, a glass of Chablis, uh, it could only have come from that place on earth. It's a pure Chardonnay. People have grown pure Chardonnay almost anywhere you can think around the world, but it never tastes quite like Chablis because that drink reflects that place on earth. Uh, and this is this is a very very precious notion in the wine world. It's you know it, it creates enormous price differentials. Um, if you go to Burgundy and, and have a glass of uh, Romanée Conti, uh, I throw that name out as if I drank it three times a week. Well, I don't. I've had about three sips in my entire life. Uh, but this is a you know a small vineyard of under two hectares, um, probably the most is, is expensive agricultural land in the world you know, regarded as being the absolute pinnacle of, of this sought after wine region. And it's all down to origin. It's all down to terroir. It's all down to the sense that the place leaves, the print of the place in the wine. And this is also quite important for tea too. Um, and even particular places can be treated with that kind of reverence in the tea world too. I'm thinking of when I was in China, uh, there's a tea there called Da Hong Pao, which means great red robe. I'm sure you, you, you know it well. Uh, and if you go and visit the, the, the great red robe area, which is wonderful, it's the Wuyi Mountains, very beautiful area to go, go to. So I recommend it if anybody ever has the chance. You'll be taken and you'll see the actual sort of legendary, the three original tea plants up on a hillside with sort of carved rock all around them. Uh, so there's enormous reverence both about that that tea coming from that place and, and the actual bushes that are legendarily have meant to have, have um, led to the tea in the first place. So, so yes, certainly when you get to China, well, when you get to the, the tea gardens of India as well, Darjeeling and all the wonderful gardens up in Darjeeling, giving you different level, different first flushes, you know, wherever you go in the tea world, I'm sure it's true if you go to, to Kenya or Malawi as well, the locals will know absolutely the best gardens to go and find the best and even within a garden, probably the, you know, the best hillsides. That this is the wonderful thing about both drinks. They are capable of reflecting these nuances of, of growing origin with enormous fidelity. So yes, for me, tea and wine are twins, absolute twins. The great, the, the world's two greatest beverages. Well, no, I won't say that because I love whiskey and beer and all the rest too, but you know, very, very great beverages for sure. Fantastic. And a note, a note to our listeners that uh, Great Red Robe is part of our Oolong podcast, so something to look out for. Um, is there anything we can learn in tea from wine or vice versa? Uh, well, I mean, it, it always grieves me that tea, and particularly I would say in the UK, you know, doesn't have the same kudos that wine does. Um, I think, you know, I hope it's come across in what I've just said that, that for me, I, I have absolutely the same reverence for, for both of them. Um, and I'm always wondering why that is. I think there are really two reasons. One is that in the UK, we're, we are over fond of our, our milky teas. Uh, you know, they are wonderful, but they aren't the only thing in the tea world. And, and if we could get beyond that, then we would discover a, you know, a wonderful, landscape open up of, of, of diversity and intrigue and fascination. And then the second thing is that, you know, I think very often we don't sell it in 
with with quite the sort of respect and reverence it deserves. If you think about great wines, you know, a great I, I referred to those great Bordeaux a little bit earlier, Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Margaux, Chateau La Tour. They come in wonderful wooden boxes, first of all, you know, 12 bottles each individually in a wooden box. Every bottle is tissue wrapped. The bottles are beautiful. The labels are beautiful. If you go to the website, there's an enormous amount of information about them. You know, they're much colossally written about by, by, by wine writers uh, down, down the generations. I think to um, just put a different perspective and, and uh, not defend, but in support of the dear old milky English breakfast tea, we certainly know that during lockdown and the pandemic, you know, consumption of tea has increased by 10%. And I think people are turning to that tea for other things such as comfort, relax, you know, this is an old, an old friend that they turn to when they're feeling a bit stressed and they need to pick me up during the day. And I think that's wonderful too. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things I've always said uh, about wine is that it's one of the reasons it has its hold over us is because it's a, an emotional drink. It, it arouses our emotions. And of course, all alcoholic drinks do that because they have alcohol in. But I, just as you've said, uh, uh, Sharon, I think, you know, tea also has this emotional dimension to it because it's warm, because there's this lovely aromatic steam coming off it, because it's comforting. It's almost sort of maternal. It's a kind of maternal experience in that way. And maybe milk indeed adds to that quality of it. So I, I completely take what you mean there. I'd just love to ask Katie, you know, since we're talking about this whole sort of image thing and, that, and how significant it can be for the, for the, for the drinker, you know, what, what could you do at Yorkshire Tea to sort of add a bit of luster to it? Can you, can you produce sort of super versions or premium versions or, I don't know, special editions or, you know, wh where do we go with that? How can we move it forward? I think the closest product that we have right now is obviously Yorkshire Golds, um, which you could traditionally call a breakfast tea, but it, it just includes the, the, five, the five best or 10 best gardens that we buy from. And they're obviously hand selected. We ensure that we do um, sustainable development projects with them as well. But to answer your question about further product development, it is a really interesting question because I think from my point of view, when I see such a different array of teas from all over the world, you do see your Chinese teas and instantly this in the office is sort of like a sense of, wow, you know, they're, they're rare they only produce a certain amount of kgs a year and they are special and your everyday breakfast tea i think it is it is a different product and it is something that everybody relies on and i think there is an aspect that it doesn't need to be special because what makes it special is the fact that people wake up in the morning and they, they can't function without a cup of tea or that it's raining and they want a cup of tea or they're upset and they want tea or they're happy and they want tea and I think that's what makes it really special. And I think when you're wanting a product that is maybe more premium, you know, people generally go for loose leaf teas or they'll, they'll go for something that is different, like a Darjeeling or, you know, loose, loose Assam. There are many aspects that, that you can go down. But in terms of everyday English breakfast tea, I think, yeah, what, what makes it special is the fact that it, it is great as it is. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I, I, I still love the, the idea of the gold. And in fact, I do know the gold, but I didn't realise it came from 10 particular gardens. So or, already that's, that's quite interesting. And, you know, one of the things I'd love to do as, a, as an enthusiast is, is read all about those individual gardens and maybe discover if, you know, the blend of, of the 10 varies from edition to edition or year to year, or depending on the vintage quality. You know, all of these things sort of lead you into the adventure of tea. Mm -hmm. And I think really that's what we need a bit more of. Uh, but, you know, we, we do the comfort very well. We all understand the comfort and that's fantastic. And it will always be comforting. But, but there's always also this world of adventure and discovery, which I think we need to, to work a little harder at. One of the things I find interesting, Katie, is that the challenge that gives you as a, as a buyer, when your gold blend, say, really takes off and you've got to suddenly find another million kilos for argument's sake from the very best gardens in the world and that that's quite an exciting challenge isn't it it is yes because as, as you're probably aware well that these gardens because of their seasonality 
and the quality windows, it is quite a challenge to ensure that you've bought the requirement that you need in the in those time periods. And I think with, with a lot of products, once it's gone, it's gone. And you, as you say, that is a challenge for the future is ensuring that if we want to produce these products that are, that are premium, we need to ensure that our supply chain is prepared for that as well. And so that will take innovation. It'll take travel to origins, um, communication with our suppliers to let them know that this is something that we want to do. And, you know, working with them hand in hand to ensure that they are able to provide what we need. So I have a question for Andrew, which is looking into the future of wine. And um, I think traditionally, looking, looking from my point of view, wine is something that is paired with meals and you know sophistication and I think lo looking forward into the future how do you think wine is going to develop into something that will continue to keep it, keep it being exciting and the future generations to want to get involved in that in that production well uh you know when I think about you know I have two sons and what they will be drinking what their grandchildren will be drinking I know it will be different I know it will be different. That this is the wonderful thing about the wine world, and I'm, I'm sure it's true of the tea world as well. It's it's always changing. It's always in process of evolving and modulating. And one way in particular in which the wine world is always evolving is that new places are always being discovered to grow mm. wine, new terroir, if you like, new new locations which had their own stamp. You know, when I when I was a little boy back in uh, the dark ages. <laughs> You know, there was no such thing as Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, you know, think about, I mean, this is an enormously popular drink category now. How could we possibly live without Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand? But it did, you know, before the late 1970s, it really didn't exist. So we are all always discovering new places uh, and, and new locations. And I think actually the pace of uh, global warming is going to change that too. Uh, a, an example closer to home here is, is the extraordinary flowering of English wines uh, or English and Welsh wines in the last uh, decade and a half, particularly sparkling wines. You know, when I first got into wine writing about, you know, 30 something years ago, it was a bit of a joke, English wine, it, unfortunately. I had a very good friend who was an English wine grower and, you know, we struggled together to try and see a way forward and we couldn't, and, but we kept at it. Uh, and now, you know, his wine is, is, is a very famous wine. He's now sold by the same wine merchant that sells Domaine de la Romani Conti. And when I first went to visit him, I got picked up in a car which had sea, a grass growing out of the back seat. So, you know, that illustrates that the level of change and transformation that's just been in my, in my three decades of doing this. And that will carry on. And I'm sure it will carry on with, with tea too. Uh, you know, African teas actually as, as a sort of, a sophisticated category is, is relatively new, I believe. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you know, maybe there will be new areas to rival Darjeeling. Maybe there will be new areas to rival, rival Assam. Maybe there are things going on in China tea, which I don't know about. Taiwan, for example, I know there's a lot going on with tea there and probably Japan too. So these are wonderfully modulating worlds that never stand still. And we can't really know what lies ahead, but there will be excitement for sure. And I think that leads really nicely into the last question um, about who is going to take all of that forward. So Katie, you represent the next generation of the tea industry. Would you recommend the tea industry to work in? I would absolutely. And especially for anybody who has an interest in food and drink. And um, I think my, ground, my background is, um, I graduated from Edinburgh with an anthropology degree, which is, is quite different to, to what I'm doing now. But what it has really given me is a grounding in cultures and society. And I think moving forward, that is so essential because as tea buyers, we've got to understand the countries that we're buying in. We've got to understand the people and their customs and what tea means for them. But also we've got to understand our consumers as well and what they want and how that's going to move forward because who knows maybe in 10-15 years it might be really difficult to supply the types of tea which we're buying now so as a career it's always changing and I think for somebody who who loves a challenge it, it's definitely it's definitely a fantastic career and and there's so much you can learn and I think from my perspective it's not something you can just go away and 
you know, watch a YouTube video on. You've got to learn from your peers. You've got to learn from people around you. I've got some colleagues here who have been in the tea industry for years and it, it's fantastic to be able to, to learn from them and it's basically passed down. But I think with the challenges that we're seeing now with the environment, with human rights and everything else that's going on within the tea growing communities, it is going to start taking a different approach as a buyer. We're going to have to understand economic impact. We're going to have to understand ethical impact, which at Taylor's is something that, we, you know, it is in our core values and um, sustainability as well as travel. Because as you've seen in the last year, we haven't been able to travel due, due to COVID. And if similar hurdles are going to arise in the next few years, we buyers are going to have to adapt to a, to a different world. And that's something that we've tried to do quite quickly. So normally when we travel, we'll be visiting suppliers, we'll be organising tasting collaborations so that we can show our suppliers what tea we would like them to make for us. And um, building relationships and in ensuring the factories are doing what they need to do. But because we haven't been able to visit these origins, we've had to do it basically online, you know, on Zoom or on, on a webcam. So it's very odd, <laughs> but, but we'll get there. And it's, it's as simple as making the tea up, sending it to our suppliers or to our whoever we're speaking to, giving them the brewing instructions for them to make it for themselves at home, and then speaking it through whilst tasting with them on our webcam. And, and explaining things just, just as, I, as I am to you now. So I think it's a tea blending career it, it is fantastic. And I would, I would honestly recommend it to anybody who, who has an interest with, in food and drink. I think that's an absolutely perfect message to end today's podcast on. I'm very confident that the tea industry is in safe hands. Um, Thank you for listening to this episode of Around the World in 80 Teas. Please remember that 21st of May is International Tea Day, so absolutely perfect opportunity to celebrate the wonderful beverage that is tea. Thank you to our guests, Andrew and Katie, and to my co-host, Will Battle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.